Chapter 5, Part A of Greener Than You Think. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Greener Than You Think by Ward Moore. Chapter 5 The South Pacific Sailing Directory. I cannot say the world greeted the end of the North American continent with either rejoicing or regret. Relief, yes. When the news of the last demolition was given and it was clear the grass was unable to bridge the gap, the imaginative could almost hear mankind emit a vast sigh. The world was saved. They could go about their business now, having written off a sixth of themselves. I was reminded of Miss Frances's remark that if you cut off a man's leg, you bestow upon him a crippled mentality. For approximately two centuries, the United States had been a leg of the global body, a limb so constantly inflicted with growing pains it caused the other parts to writhe in sympathy. Now the member was cut off, and everyone thought that with the troublesome appendage gone, life would be pleasanter and simpler. Debtor nations expanded their chests when they remembered Uncle Shylock was no more. Industrial countries looked eagerly to enlarge their markets in those places where Americans formerly sold goods. Small states whose inhabitants were occasionally addicted to carrying off tourists and holding them for ransom now felt they could dispense with those foreign undersecretaries whose sole business it had been to write diplomatic notes of apology. But it was a crippled world, and the lost leg still twitched spectrally. I don't think I speak now as a native of the United States, for with my international interests I believe I have become completely a cosmopolitan. But for everyone, Englishman, Italian, Africander, or citizen of Liberia, the disappearance of America created a revolution in their lives, a change perhaps not immediately apparent, but eventually to be recognized by all. It was the trivial things we Americans had taken for granted as part of our daily lives and taught the rest of the world to appreciate which were most quickly missed. The substitution of English, Turkish, Egyptian, or Russian cigarettes for good old camels or luckies. The impossibility of buying a bottle of Coca-Cola at any price. The disappearance of the solacing wad of chewing gum the pulsing downbeat of a hot band. These were the first things whose loss was noticed. For a long time I have been too busy to attend moving pictures, except rarely, but a man, especially a man with much on his mind, needs relaxation, and I would not choose the foreign movies with their morbid emphasis on problems and crime and sex, in preference to the clean-cut American product, which always satisfied the nobler feelings by showing the reward of the honest, the downfall of evil doers, and the purity of love and motherhood. Art is all very well, but need it be sordid? As I told George Thario, I am no Philistine. I think the Parthenon and the Taj Mahal are lovely buildings, but I would not care to have an office in either of them. Give me Radio City. I don't mind the highbrow programs the British Broadcasting Corporation put on. I myself am quite capable of understanding and enjoying them, but I imagine there are thousands of housewives who would prefer a good serial to bring romance into their lives. I don't object to a commercial world in which competitors go through the formality of pretending to be scrupulously fair in talking about each other's products, but I must admit I miss the good old American slapdash advertising which yelled, Buy my deodorant or you'll stink! Wash your mouth with my antiseptic or you'll lose your job! Brush your teeth with my dentifrice or no one will kiss you! Powder your face with my lead arsenic, or you'll keep your maiden head. I would give a lot of money to hear a singing commercial once more, or watch the neon lights north of Times Square urge me to buy something for which I have no possible use. Living within your income is fine, but the world lacks the good you'd have bought on the installment plan. Getting what you need is sound policy, but how many lives were lightened by the young men working their way through college, or the fuller brushmen? I think there was a subconscious realization of this which came gradually to the top. 
In the beginning the almost universal opinion was that the loss of the aching limb was for the better. I have heard so-called cultured foreigners discuss the matter in my presence, doubtless unaware I was an American. No more tourists, they gloated, to stand with their backs to the Temple of Heaven in Peking and explain the superior construction of the Masonic Hall at Cedar Rapids. No more visitors to the Champagne Caves at Reims to inquire where they could get a shot of real bourbon. No more music lovers at Salzburg or Glyndebourne to regret audibly the lack of a peppy swing tune. No more gourmets in Vienna demanding thick steaks rare and smothered in onions. But this period of smug self-congratulation was soon succeeded by a strange nostalgia, which took the form of romanticizing the lost land. American books were reprinted in vast quantities in the English-speaking nations, and translated anew in other countries. American movies were revived and imitated. Fashionable speech was powdered with what were conceived to be Yankee expressions, and a southern drawl was assiduously cultivated. Best-selling historical novels were laid in the United States, and popular operas were written about Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, and Kit Carson. Men told their growing sons to work hard, for now there was left no land of opportunity to which they could emigrate, no country where they could become rich overnight with little effort. Instead of fairy tales, children demanded stories of forty-niners and the wedding of the rails, and on the streets of Bombay and Cairo, urchins, probably quite unaware of the memorial gesture, could be heard whistling Casey Jones. But hand in hand with this newfound romantic love went a completely practical attitude towards those Americans still existing in the flesh. The earliest expatriates, being generally men of substance, were well received. The thousands who had crossed by small boats from Canada to Greenland, and from Greenland to Iceland to Europe, were by definition in a different category, and found the quota system their fathers and grandfathers had devised used to deny their own entrance. They were as bewildered and hurt as children that any nation could be at once so short-sighted and so heartless as to bar homeless wanderers. "'We bring you knowledge and skills in our own need,' they said in effect. "'We will be an asset to your country if you admit us.' The Americans could not understand. They themselves had been fair to all and only kept out undesirable immigrants. Gradually the world geared itself to a slower tempo. The go-getter followed the brontosaurus to extinction, and we Americans, with the foresight to carry on our businesses from new bases, profited by the un-American backwardness of our competitors. At this time, I dare say I was among the hundred most important figures of the world. In the marketing and packaging of our original products, I had been forced to acquire paper mills and large interests in aluminum and steel. From there the progression to tin mines and rolling mills, to coal fields and railroads, to shipping lines and machine shops, was not far. Consolidated pemmican, once the center of my business existence, was now but a minor point on its periphery. I expanded horizontally and vertically, delighted to show my competitors that Americans, even when deprived of America, were not robbed of the traditional American enterprise. It was at this time, many months after we had given up all hope of hearing from Joe again, that General Thario received a long-delayed package from his son. It contained the third movement of the symphony and a covering letter. Dear Father, Stuart Thario, General, I shall not finish this letter tonight. It will be sent with as much of the first symphony as makes a worthy essence when it goes. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts, but there is a place perhaps not in life, but somewhere, for the imperfect, for the incomplete. The great and small alike achieve fulfillment, satisfaction. Must this be a ruthless denial of all between? I have always despised musicologists, makers of program notes, little men who tell you the opening chords of Opus 67, describe fate knocking at the door, or the call of the yellow hammer. A child draws a picture and writes on it, this is a donkey, and when Grom proves it to be a self-portrait by translating the Jupiter symphony into words. Having said this, let me stultify myself, but for private ears alone, 
as a bit of personal history, not an explanation to be appended to the score. I started out to express, in terms of strings and winds, the emotions roused in me by the sights and thoughts of the grass, much as L. V. B. took a mistaken idealization of his youth as a starting point for Opus 55. But just as no man is an island, so no theme stands alone. There is a cord binding the lesser to the greater, a mystic union between all things. The grass is not an entity, but an aspect. I thought I was writing about my country, conceived of myself in a reversed snobbishness, a haughty humility, a proud abasement, as a sort of superior smetana. Did you know that as a boy I dreamed of the day when I should receive my commission as second lieutenant? Boston, Massachusetts. I interrupted this letter to sketch some of the middle section of the fourth movement, and I have wasted a precious week following a false trail. And, of course, the thought persists that it may not have been a false trail at all, but the right one. The business of saying something is a perpetual wrestle with doubt. We leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination, Portsmouth probably, and then somewhere in Maine, hoping to wrench from fate the time to finish the score. It seems more than a little pompous to continue my explanation. The grass, the United States, humanity, God, whatever we write about, we write about the same things. Still, there is a limit to individual perception, and it seems to me my concern, at least my musical concern, is enclosed by Canada and Mexico, the Pacific and Atlantic. So rightly or wrongly, even if the miracle occur and I do finish in time, I cannot leave. A short distance, such a short distance from where I scribble these words, Vanzetti died. No more childish thought than atonement was ever conceived. It is a base and baseless gratification. Evil is not recalled. So I do not sentence myself for the murder of Vanzetti or for my manifold crimes. Who am I to pass judgment even on me? But all of us, accusers and accused, condemners and condemned, will remain forever indistinguishable. If the requiem for our faults and our virtues, if the celebration of our past and the prayer for our resurrection can be orchestrated, then the fourth movement will be finished. If not, a rustic main. By the best calculations, we have about three more days. I do not think the symphony can be finished, but the thought no longer disturbs me. It would be a good thing to complete it just as it would be a good thing to sit on fleecy clouds and enjoy eternal, never-melting, never-cloying ice-cream cones, celestially flavored. The man who is to carry this letter waits impatiently. I must finish quickly before his conviction of my insanity outweighs the promises I have made of reward from you and causes him to run from me. My love to Mamma, the siblings, and yourself and kindly regards to the great magnet, Joe. About the same time, I also received a letter which somehow got through the protective screening of my secretaries. Albert Weiner, Savoy Hotel, Thames Embankment, W.C. 1. Sir, you may recall making an offer I considered premature. It is now no longer so. I am at home afternoons from one until six at fourteen Little Bow Street, EC three, third floor rear. Josephine, Spencer, Francis. In spite of her rudeness at our last meeting, my good nature caused me to send a cab for her. She wore the identical grey suit of years before, and her face was still unlined and dubiously clean. How do you do, Miss Francis? I'm glad to find you among the lucky ones. Nowadays, if we don't hear from old friends, we automatically assume their loss. She looked at me as one scans an acquaintance whose name has been embarrassingly forgotten. There is no profit for you in this politeness, Weiner, she said abruptly. I am here to beg a favor. Anything I can do for you, Miss Francis, will be a pleasure, I assured her. She began using a toothpick, but it was not the old-fashioned gold one, just an ordinary wooden splinter. Hmm. 
You remember asking me to superintend gathering specimens of Cynodon Dactylon? Circumstances have greatly altered since then, I answered. They have a habit of doing so. I merely mentioned your offer because you coupled it with a chance to advance my own research as an inducement. I am on the way to develop the counteragent, but to advance further I need to make tests upon the living grass itself. The World Control Congress has refused me permission to use specimens. I have no private means of evading their fiat. An excellent thing. The decrees of the Congress are issued for the protection of all. Hypocrisy as well as unctuousness. What do you expect me to do? You have a hundred hireling chemists, all of them with a string of degrees at your service. I want to borrow two of them, and be landed on some American mountain above the snow line where I can continue to work. Besides being illegal, to mention such a thing is apparently hypocritical. Such a hazardous and absurd venture is hardly in the nature of a business proposition, Miss Francis. Philanthropic, then. I have given fifty thousand pounds to set up nursery schools right here in London, so the mothers of the little brats will be free to work in your factories. I have donated ten thousand pounds to Indian famine relief so that you might cut the wages of your Hindu workers. I have subscribed five thousand pounds for sanitation in Szechuan, thereby lessening absenteeism from sickness among your coolies. I will not stoop to answer your insinuations, I said. I merely mentioned my guests to show that my charities are on a worldwide scale, and there is little room in them for the relief of individuals. Do you think I come to you for a personal sinecure? I don't ask if you have no concern outside selfish interest, for the answer is immediate and obvious. But isn't it to that same selfish interest to protect what remains of the world? If the other continents go as North America has gone, will you alone be divinely translated to some extraterrestrial sphere? And if so, will you take your wealth and power with you? I am supporting three laboratories devoted exclusively to anti-graminous research, and anyway, the rest of the world is amply protected by the oceans. She removed the toothpick in order to laugh unpleasantly. Once a salesman, always a salesman, Wainer. Lie to yourself. Deny facts. Brazen it out. The world was safe behind the salt band, too, in the days when Josephine Francis was a quack and a charlatan. Admitting your great attainments, Miss Francis, the fact remains that you are a woman, and the adventure you propose is hardly one for a lady to undertake. Wiener, you are ineffable. I'm not a lady, I'm a chemist. The conversation deadlocked as I waited for her to go. Oddly enough, in spite of her sex and the illegality of her proposal, I was inclined to help her, if she had approached me in a reasonable manner and not with the uncouth bearing of a superior toward an inferior. If she could find a counteragent, I thought, if she could find a weapon, then the possibility of utilizing the grass as a raw material for food concentrates, a design still tantalizingly just beyond the reach of our research workers, might be realized. Labor costs would be cut to a minimum. I could not let the woman be her own worst enemy. I was big enough to overlook her unfortunate attitudes, and see through the cranky exterior to the worthy idealist and true woman beneath. I was interrupted in my thoughts by Miss Frances speaking again. North American land titles have no value right now, but a man with money who knew ahead of time the grass could be destroyed. How clumsy, I thought, trying to appeal to a cupidity I don't possess, as if I would cheat people by buying up their very homes for sordid speculation. Miss Francis, I said, purely out of generosity and in remembrance of old times, I am inclined to consider helping you. 
I suppose you have the details of the equipment you will need, the qualifications of your assistants, and a rough idea of what mountain you might prefer as a location? Of course. And she began rattling off a catalogue of items, stabbing the air with her toothpick as a sort of running punctuation. I stopped her with a raised hand. Please, reduce your list to writing and leave it with my secretary. I will see what can be done. As soon as she had gone, I picked up the phone and cabled Tony Preblesham to report to me immediately. The decision to send him with Miss Francis had been instantaneous, but had I thought about it for hours, no happier design could have been conceived. Outside of General Thario, there was not another man in my organization I could trust so implicitly. The expedition required double, no triple secrecy, and Preblesham could not only guard against any ulterior and selfish aims Miss Francis might entertain, to say nothing of the erratic or purely feminine impulses which could possibly operate to the disadvantage of all concerned, but take the opportunity to give the continent a general survey, both to keep in view the utilization of the weed, whether or not it could be conquered, and whatever possibilities a lay observer might see as to the grass perishing of itself. End of chapter 5, part A.